May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Gook Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Gook Audio and Gook Archives, preserving the legacy of Shinju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his. And those whose paths cross his. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So uh, today uh, we I'm going to tell you about David Padua. He is a fascinating guy, a brilliant guy. Uh, a multifaceted guy. And um, look, I'm just going to go right in now to our pause to meditate. So when you hear the bell, if you have such a mind, uh, hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're through with the meditation or whatever, hit unpause. And we'll be here to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever. And um, we'll get right into telling you about David Padua. Uh, this is not a uh, podcast with David. I've got a lot of material from him. I'm in touch with him. Uh, but um, And he's got a great voice. But uh, anyway, so uh, I'm just... Uh, going to read you some things and tell you some things. But the first thing I'm going to tell you is he has a book coming out soon. And um, there's a lot I would like to say, but I think this book is going to help fill in a lot of the blanks and say it better. Uh, because this book is about um, uh, his very interesting life. Now, uh, the name of the book is The Tetralemma. The Tetralemma. And it is published by Hapax Press, H-A-P-A-X. And um, it's by David Padua, P-A-D-W-A, but you're not going to find it listed that way because he... um, uh, it says a novel by Joel Ash. Now it's not a secret that it's by David, but he figured uh, giving it a, a pseudonym uh, would uh, reduce any uh, unwanted communication, <laughs> something like that. Uh, I think I've got it in a statement here. Uh, but anyway, here what, what I got, what I received was. The Tetralemma, a Buddhist entertainment. A serial comic tour through modern Buddhism, the story illustrates how life's completely random encounters casually create a chain of events on the meaning of silent words in one's mind, of thought, of consciousness, of chance and necessity, philosophical emptiness, the middle way, psychedelic chemicals, anatomy, mathematics, neuroscience, enlightenment, machine intelligence, and the absolute indispensable future of sex. Paperback, 1659. Pre-order. Look, you can pre-order this book. Uh, from uh, Amazon, you know, um, or independent booksellers. So if you go to tetralimma.org, um, you'll, you'll learn a little more. T E T R A L E M M A.org. 
uh, oh, hey, here's a, a, a press release he did for the local uh, papers in Santa Fe. 90-year-old David Padua has written a novel called The Tetralemma. Oh, look. Katsukoti. Is that what it says? I think so. Katsukoti in Sanskrit. Huh. Using the pen name of Joel Ash, available on Amazon. It is the tale of a young scientific polymath who, having made sudden wealth in the computer industry, then has a variety of encounters with Buddhism, LSD, a journey through India, a Burmese Vihara, Vihara. here in Bali they say Vihara, Uh, that's like a monastery, wisdom-bearing damsels, a Tibetan Lama, then takes the refuges, ends up in Kyoto, chanting the Heart Sutra, and returns to America, wondering what to do with his secular self. Described as a serial comic tour through modern Buddhism, the story illustrates how life's completely random encounters casually create a chain of events on the meaning of silent words in one's mind and of thought, of consciousness, of chance and necessity, philosophical emptiness, the middle way, psychedelic chemicals, mathematics, neuroscience, enlightenment, machine intelligence, and the absolute indispensable future of sex. That was similar to, but not exactly like the list before, and I was happy to read it again because it's so thick. Uh, I wanted to experience it again. All right, now listen. Here's something he sent to me on what the tetralemma is. (laughs) Hey, this guy is a heavy hitter. Like in Santa Fe, he liked to hang out with the what is it, the Santa Fe Institute, maybe it was called. Uh, and these are like, you know, uh, theoretical physicists that are into, uh, uh, you know, the advanced modern physics, uh, chaos theory. And, uh, oh, here, look, I, I just Googled uh, the Santa Fe Institute. Santa Fe dot edu. Uh, so the Santa Fe Institute was founded in 1984 by a group of scientists frustrated with the narrow disciplinary confines of academia. They wanted to tackle big questions that spanned different fields, and they felt the only way these questions could be posed and solved was through the intermingling of scientists of all kinds, physicists, biologists, economists, anthropologists, and many others. All right, so that gives you an idea. Anyway, uh, my point was David's always been into stuff that I can just sit and listen, <laughs> and I can hear the words, but uh, uh, I'm, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't comprehend it all. I just go, well, that's far out. Anyway, so here we are. The Tetralemma states that with reference to any... A logical proposition X, there are four possibilities. Affirmation, negation, both or neither. This fourfold negation is sourced in the epistemological tradition of India. Buddhist logic has been particularly familiar with the employment of the fourfold negation as evidenced in the tradition of Nagarjuna and the Madhyamika school of the middle way. Uh, all right. So um, th- th- that's what he sent me on that. Uh, uh, all right, let me tell you a little bit more about David. I talked to him in 2008 on the phone, and I took some notes. So he said, uh, 
I met Suzuki Roshi a couple of times at Page Street. The only personal meeting was when he and Richard came to my place on 86th Street in New York. Uh, so that was about in uh, 1966 or 67 when we were fundraising to buy Tassahara. Uh And uh, so he said, we went across the street to eat lobster. Suzuki Roshi uh, returned the menu to Richard and said, lobster. The lady came out with a bib and a whole red lobster. He'd expected lobster sashimi. <laughs> it was a source of merriment, surprise to him. Uh, here was the red monster. It was fun. Uh, I had recently sold a company to Xerox and was also going to Millbrook. They had a good library. Right. Uh, Yes, David, you were going to Millbrook because of their library. <laughs> but I will say that, um, so David was involved with uh, Larry and Albert and them and the LSD stuff at Millbrook, but uh, he wasn't caught up in it like them. Uh, I mean, this is what I gather uh, just from knowing him and, you know, having and knowing a lot about them. Uh, so, um, but I want to go back to um, uh, this uh, meeting with uh, uh, Shunya Suzuki and Richard Baker there. David said, um, told them, he said, well, I can't help you, uh, you know, with Tassahara they're talking about, uh, you know, the new monastery and all that. And he said, but um, uh, I know someone who can, Chester Carlson. And Chester Carlson, you know, was the uh, inventor of Xerox. And uh, David, and, as you will hear in this, um, uh, he was heavily involved with Xerox. He sold them his business and then had a, a, a high administrative position like director or something of Xerox. And, uh, but didn't stay in it with it a long time. He moved on. Uh, but um, so Chester Carlson, who owned Xerox, was uh, interested in Buddhism and practice, and um, uh, he he gave serious amounts of money to some uh, Zen groups, and uh, really he put us over the edge to buy Tassahara. Um, uh, there are three major donors listed uh, for buying Tassahara. Chester Carlson, uh, Edward Johnson, and Silas Hoadley, which people are not aware of. Um, but uh, Chester Carlson gave the most, and really he is considered like a founder of uh, Tassar. And this is because of David. Incidentally, David said, I can't help you, but he was a donor too. So... Uh, you know, he said uh, Richard Albert was, you know, getting in a bad place. You know, the, the um, and Albert says that too in, in himself in, in, doc, in documentaries and stuff. He's written that the Millbrook trip, you know, taking a lot of acid and everything sort of went downhill. And uh, so anyway, uh, so uh, they went to Kathmandu. Uh, and they met Bhagavan Das. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was the Be Here Now trip. And uh, I think David provided the vehicle, among other things. Uh, I remember uh, uh, David just told me personally, oh, a long time ago, about how they were looking for a guru, right? And so... Um, uh, they were, you know, walking like, I don't know where, in Nepal or s somewhere. And um, they met some guru on the side of the road and uh, they asked him if he would teach them. And uh, he said, uh, uh, he, he wasn't responding. And so they were, they were really begging, oh, please teach us, teach us. 
And he said the, the man uh, had a stick, you know, like a teacher's stick or a staff he had. And that he ha pushed it out and he said, beat me. They said, what? He said, beat me. Uh, so, uh, and I think how it went was, and he'll correct me on this, but uh, I, I think how it went was a fellow named Harish, who was traveling with them, uh, maybe it was their driver, took the stick and beat the guru on the side of the road, probably not real hard took the stick and hit him and stuff. And he said, very well, if you're willing to beat me, uh, if you're that, you know, desperate to know uh, the Dharma or whatever, uh, come have tea. And then they went and talked to him about the Dharma. I remember that story he told me. Um, oh, and there's another one I really like. Uh, so he was practicing with uh, Dujam Rinpoche in uh, in uh, Nepal, and um, he, he met a lama in a restaurant or whatever it was, uh, who asked David what he was doing there, and David said he was studying with. And the Lama said, oh, very impressive. And, uh, and the Lama asked, uh, what, what practice are you studying? And he said, um, Dzogchen, which is like Zazen. And the Lama went, oh, very impressive. That is, you know, the highest practice or something like that. And then uh, the Lama said to him, Something like, um, let me give you a piece of advice. Don't ask him any questions. Now, that was not what David had in mind. That is not how he was approaching it. But um, from that point, he did not ask him questions. And he went to him and he asked if he could meditate with him. He said, I said to Dujam, can we meditate today? He raised his index finger, looked directly at me, and said, ah. And David said, ever since that moment, I never asked him a question about Dharma again. We talked history, politics, etc., but not my mind. A couple of years ago, uh, I asked David if he'd do a podcast. And uh, he said, no, I'll just send you something, and you can read it. Or, or, or I said, I could read something. He said, okay, I'll send you something. Uh, so uh, it's all in lowercase. <laughs> it's sort of run together. So let me read it. My first engagement with Buddha Dharma was bookish when I was 18, 72 years ago now. I found some... Theravadan materials and found them profound and engaging, even though it was written for uh, enrobed practitioners. I found D.T. Suzuki and Alan Watts and fell in love with the Mahayana subtleties of Zen, still bookish, but I began to experiment with meditation, but without a teacher, reading lots more of them. My first time in India in 1966 had little exposure to Buddhism, and Lord Buddha was simply the eighth avatar of Vishnu. My second India trip in 1967, when we met in McLeod Ganj, or Upper Dharamsala, and that led to uh, our brief meeting with uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama later, we spent a bit of time uh, with acid at Sarnath, then to Kathmandu without any Buddhists. And finally, my journey on to Japan, where I spent a couple of months getting a real exposure to Japanese Zen, which I quite liked. Zen was my way, it seemed. 
Then in late 1969 or early 1970, I met a young Lama in New York who had recently arrived from Scotland. His name was Chogyam Trungpa. We had a pleasant lunch, and he was dressed like a Westerner. I asked him to look me up if he came to New Mexico. A few months later, he did so. We spent several days together, which were enormously interesting. Significantly, the two of us took a drive up to the old Anasazi Indian ruins at Puye. We climbed a ladder down into an ancient kiva. There, for the first time, I formally took the refuges. This was before he established his seat in Boulder. We had occasional meetings in the following years, nothing very close, but always friendly, and I was extremely grateful to him for showing me another path, probably called crazy wisdom without using those words. But I still didn't have my root teacher. That had to wait until the arrival of Dujum Rinpoche. In Santa Fe, I bought the 1404 Cerro Gordo house and two vacant adjacent lots in 1970. In late 1972, His Holiness H.H. Dujum Rinpoche, together with his family, stayed with me at 1404, accompanying him was Sonam Kazi, a, Sik- a Sikhamese whom I had met in India in 1966 and who had been an interpreter for the young Dalai Lama at one time. Sonam was an in-law of Dujum Rinpoche and was accompanying him, Shimpin Dawan family, on their round-the-world trip. They had been with Tartang Tulku in California and were on their way to New York, France, and New Delhi. Their visit to New Mexico was a private rest and recreation holiday arranged by Sonam, and it was my unbelievable luck to have Dujum Rinpoche entirely to myself for 10 intensely interpersonal days, which was when I became his student. He asked me dozens of penetrating questions about myself, my sexual behavior, and many personal things. I was full of questions for him. He then invited me to come to India and study with him at his home in Kalimpong in West Bengal a few months later in 1973. While still in Santa Fe after more than a week together, I asked Rinpoche if he would give a talk on Buddhism to interested persons. He agreed, and his son, Shimpen Dawa and Sonam assisted in translation. I then put up half a dozen eight and a half by eleven notices around town, and on the designated evening, some fifty odd persons crowded into the big room at fourteen o four and sat on the floor to hear Rinpoche's talk. Dennis Hopper came down from Taos. It was a wonderful and inspiring event taking place on the evening of Rinpoche's departure and brought a number of people into an emerging Buddhist Sangha in Santa Fe. This talk was followed on the day of Rinpoche's departure by an immense, brilliant, and durable rainbow in the sky to the east. It all seemed mysteriously auspicious. Several months later in India, I took Genyan Upsaka vows at Nyingma Lama's College in Clementown in 1973 and went on to Kalimpong. Rinpoche arranged for me to have a cell up at Zangdo Palbri. It was an incredibly fruitful time, which I won't discuss here. Before my departure from India, Dujum Rinpoche and I discussed erecting a stupa in America. I explained to him the relevance of a large Zen Buddhist Sangha in the U.S., which would not easily bridge into the Vajrayana. We agreed that the broad concept of the Mahayana was suitable. He gave me his own drawings of the four-sided Mahayana Chorten 
design as well as various relics for its interior. He also gave me specific instruction not to attempt building the stupa myself, but to wait until a Tibetan Lama was available to supervise and sacralize the construction. Nothing was said about the stupa's location. I returned to Santa Fe at the end of the year. In early 1974, Sonam Kazi and his wife visited me in Santa Fe, and I took them to overnights on the Hopi Reservation to meet Tibetan light Native Americans. Somehow during that trip, the name of Harold Talbot came up, and Sonam mentioned that Dodrup Chen was staying with Talbot in Massachusetts. Why not invite him to Santa Fe to supervise the construction of the stupa, I asked. Sonam thought this was a great idea because Dodrup Chen was a famous builder of stupas all over Sikkim. I then underwrote Sonam's trip to Massachusetts to see if he could fetch Dodrup Chen to Santa Fe. Uh, Dodrup Chen arrived, and this quickly led to the question of where to build it. There had been earlier discussions about locating the stupa in Trucas or in the Huerfano Valley in Colorado or up in Taos near the Lama Foundation, but when Dodrup Chen arrived, he consulted various texts in his possession involving sacred geomancy and declared that the ideal location would be on the vacant lot adjacent to the 1404 house where he was staying. The auspicious signs, according to him, were that a hill in the shape of a tortoise should lie to the north of the stupa, and this was clearly the case of the Cerro Gordo. Furthermore, there should be a flowing river from east to west to the south of the location, and this was indeed the Santa Fe River. In other words, this vacant lot adjacent to 1404, David's home, was ideal, and that's why it was built at that spot. Geomancy. All right, so uh, he goes on to talk in great detail about the construction of the Chorton. Now, uh, when... uh, I, I can remember visiting uh, David there at his home and seeing the Chorton uh, when it was newly built. Um, that is now uh, Joan Halifax's home. Uh, after David, I think David gave that place to Richard Baker, and that's where Richard Baker lived while he was in Santa Fe. And Richard Baker took care of of the Chorton, that's what we call that stupa. After Richard Baker lived in that house, Joan Halifax moved into it. And now her, her she has her center, she has the Chorton, she has her sitting place. Um, exact, you know, it, the, the future of the Chorton uh, is uncertain. When, when Elon and I were living in Santa Fe in 1992, uh, to July to 93 July, uh, Jonathan Altman took me over to the Chorton, and it was very important to him. He was on the board of the nonprofit that had been set up to take care of it. And um, I said, well, uh, okay, I thought it was important to him and knew it was important to David. So look, I said, I'll, I'll have a... Uh, I'll lead a meditation here one night a week. So for the year I was there, uh, Elon and I did that. We took turns because we had a two-and-a-half-year-old kid, and there was a playground right next to it, or there was a little park and uh, right next to it, and it had some playground stuff. But anyway, so... Uh, there, and then sometimes i just go by myself. So for a year, we did not miss. Bang. I like every Wednesday evening or something... Here's something uh, Alan Watts wrote on David Podwell. When, whenever I'm in Kyoto, I seem to meet unexpected friends from home, and I shall never forget a long night spent with Dome Alred Graham and David Padua in the Ryokan above the Miyako. 
Uh, Dom Alred was then prior of the Benedictine House at Portsmouth, Rhode Island, undertaking a spiritual pilgrimage to Asia. Uh, incidentally, Dom Alred Graham wrote, I think it might have been called Zen Catholicism. He wrote a book on Zen and, and Catholicism. David Potter, well, back to once now. David Potter was on vacation from being a director of uh, Xerox Corporation, having had the sense to drop out after a swift and remarkable career in law and business, exemplifying the saying that the secret of the mastery of life is to know when to stop. <laughs> he came to Kyoto from India carrying nothing but a knapsack and a copy of the Lankavadara Sutra. And it should be said here that his home in New York contains the world's coziest library, comprising a most respectable collection of works on Mahayana Buddhism. David went into a discourse on the relativity of all concepts and ideas that made our heads swim. Hey, that's something like, you're making Alan Watts' head swim. See, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> he reduced all basics to babble. He developed the epistemological impasse of knowing about knowing to demonstrate that we knew nothing at all about anything, that survival was a whim, time an hallucination, and sanity a majority consensus of the blind. He was like a trapeze artist at a hundred feet with no net, playing with his own sanity over an abyss of absolute madness, which, who knows, might be a viable life form if, uh, if we could ever decide what we mean by viable. He showed that the act of making sense between each other had in itself no more sense than the gurgle of a stream. With the whole of his own remarkable intellect, he tore every intellectual cannon to shreds, and all this without bitterness or hostility, in the feeling of a joyous and terrible dance, for he seemed to be Shiva doing the Tandava dance that brings all the worlds to an end. Dome Alred listened and listened, obviously cooking inside, for David was repeating in a modern way the dialectical process that the Madhyamika school of Nagarjuna had worked out as an intellectual approach to enlightenment by teasing the mind completely out of thought. In effect, this can bring about the same para ridi or flip at the root of consciousness as the contemplation of one's eventual nothingness. So that's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Alan Watts on David Padua. Now here's Ram Das on David Padua. Oh, this is from the 1980, from a 1980 Albuquerque uh, Sun interview. The Albuquerque Sense, you know, the big newspaper in Albuquerque. It was when I lived around there. So Ram Dass says, I'm in a funny situation. One of the ways I pick up information is that I have a lot of friends who are very deeply involved in this and that. I can sit down with Dwayne Elgin, who is just finishing a book on voluntary simplicity and was a presidential advisor on issues of lifestyle and worked for the Stanford Research Institute. In Santa Fe, David Padua is one of my closest friends. David is probably the most brilliant human being I have ever met. He can look at a page and then close the book and tell you the whole page. He never forgets anything he ever knew. You ask, how do I know the news? See, David went uh, to the University of Chicago at 14, had to wait until he was 21 before they would give him his international law degree. He was working for the United Nations after that as an advisor in economics and maritime law, started his own business called Basic Systems, built it up to a business, sold it to Xerox, 
took his $5 million profit and uh, took off, went and studied Buddhism in India and the mountains and so on. Then he started another business a few years ago called Agrogenetics Corporation. He is now perhaps the largest independent seed owner in the world, and he is interested in things that can change the entire food chain supply system in the world. He is a very conscious being. He is tuned to oil, politics, structures. He knows Russian history. So I will go and take a hot tub with him, and we will sit for a few hours, and I will have just saved up a series of questions like, what is Russia's predicament at the moment? Uh, he'll discuss the political, the economic, the Chinese rice fields on the border of Russia, how much grain the Russians can take in through their ports, how many metric tons, and what kind of drought they would need before they would have to invade China to survive or their government would crumble because of food riots and how thin the chains are of food around the world. We will just have discussions for hours, and I will use him as a resource, like reading the encyclopedia, except it is up to date. Now, I have him on one end, and he is in the business world, the money markets, has a tremendous grasp of history and political, economic, stock market manipulation, stuff like that. On the other hand, I have all of these friends who are very active in anti-nuclear things, uh, in social action. As a scientist, I know that stuff is not clear enough. Those data aren't clear enough yet. I mean, Allen Ginsberg, who is one of my resource people, will come and say, well, I was at a meeting and the waste toxicity is over the critical point. We have done ourselves in. It's all over. So I'll say to David, hey, David, Alan says so-and-so. And David says, oh, that's a crock. We have this and this and there is this safeguard and this is happening and this is happening. And I say, are you sure you're not just hiding from it? No, no, we have got this waste possibility and, you know, blah, blah, etc. And I say, but what if there's an earthquake? I end up without a clear view, so I can't say this is bad, that is good. And I realize that this isn't good guys and bad guys either, not at all. The people that are committed to technology, technology obviously have a certain blind spot. David is one of these people where they feel technology can solve every problem. The people that are anti-technology are committed to the idea that technology will slowly do us in. The relation between our intellect and our wisdom is what is at stake here. We are almost hypnotically entranced by technology, just like by psychiatry, just like by drugs. There is an addiction to technology that we are just coming out of now. Wisdom undercuts addiction. So that's Richard Albert on David Pond was just something he was thinking one day. And now, I, I, I think uh, Richard uh, Albert, I think Ram Dass was being a little simplistic there, making like David believes everything can be solved with technology, and nah, I wouldn't say that. Here's a cool thing. Uh, David says, I asked my llama if he could compress, I guess, Dujum, right? If he could compress everything he knew into a single word, he thought for a while, looked at me, raised a finger, and said, amazement. Um, so, you know, I gave you a few snippets here and there of uh, about David Padua. Now, uh, I think uh, I am looking forward to reading uh, his book, uh, The Tetralemma which will be available in June. Um, uh, if you're going to get it from Amazon, uh, pre-order it. That'll, that'll help them uh, print more books for uh, bookstores. And um, well, let me mention uh, uh, that uh, David, uh, I read David's prior book to Katrinka uh, out loud. You know, it's really good. Uh, it's called Incident at Lukla, and um, it's a novel, uh, you know, has to do with um, 
you know, high mountain climbing. Which he does. Nepal, which he knows. Tibet, China. Smuggling rare mushrooms into China. You know, uh, there's a lot of intrigue. Uh, it's a... Mm, it's like a, you know, a high mountain uh, Tibetan Nepalese uh, detective story. It's really cool. Uh, so, incident at Lukla, and I think he used his real name with that one, David Padua. Uh, he also uh, narrated the book for Audible. Uh, and it's Hapax Press, too, H A P A X press. So, uh, well, now remember you can go to tetralimma.com T-E-T-R-A-L-E-M-M-A tetralimma.org Okay. Very good. Look forward to getting that book and uh, hearing a lot more about David's life, which we have just touched on. I could tell you other stuff about him, but that's it for today. This has been a Cuke Audio podcast. I'm DC Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives coming to you from Sleepy Sonor with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cochita, and dear lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Thank you.